Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is the second graduate student speaker series event of the semester. Um, I'm going to do a quick kind of intro and then we'll get started with um, the panel discussion. Um, so first, I would like to thank um, Kelsey, the library's PR director, and Laura Moy, uh, the director of graduate student support for helping to promote the series. Um, my name is Kara Flynn, and I'm the research and educational services archivist in Special Collections, um, and I facilitate this grad student speaker series. Um, it began in 2018, and it's presented in partnership with the Graduate School and in International Education. And the goal of this series is to provide an opportunity um, for graduate students to um, not only share research that they've conducted in special collections, but also have a chance to um, have a public speaking opportunity um, as well. So today we are joined by uh, Michael Anthony, Amanda McGee, and Ryan Smith. All are graduate uh, students in the history department, um, and all of them have been proxy researchers themselves during, actually I think before and during the pandemic in some cases. Um, for those of you that are not uh, maybe as familiar with the term proxy research, um, uh, proxy researchers are basically researchers that are hired um, by outside uh, researchers um, who can't come to campus for any reason. So. Um, Special Collections has always had graduate student proxy researchers, um, but we are uh, having a discussion about it today because um, during the pandemic, when we had travel restrictions and we were open to um, campus affiliates only, um, proxy researchers made up the bulk of the researchers that we saw in Special Collections um, for many, many months. And uh, the work that proxy researchers do allows other researchers in other places to continue their projects and their work even when they can't come physically um, to the reading room. Uh, so they serve a really important role in, uh, in the realm of special collections and archival research, um, and especially so during the pandemic um, when we couldn't travel. <laughs> So um, I am going to turn it over to our panelists in just a second. Um, but basically the format of this uh, discussion today um, is going to be that the panelists will give a little bit of an intro about themselves and the work that they've done as proxy researchers. And then um, I have some questions to ask them. And if you have a question you would like to ask, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, the more questions, the better, um, and we'll have a discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and um, I'll let our panelists take it away. I can go first if you want. All right, so I'm Michael Anthony. I am, like Kara said, we're all in the history department. We're all in the PhD program here. Um, we, I think, yeah, all three of us are teaching at this point, um, but Personally, I'm doing my own uh, archival research on the Catcher Race Riot in Crawford County in 1923. I gave a speech on that actually last spring for the Graduate Student Speaker Series, but I've done quite a bit of proxy research both before and after the pandemic. Um, I'm from Conway, Arkansas, so I really like to do Arkansas history. So usually when I take on proxy research, I prefer to do topics that I'm more familiar with. So the only proxy research I've done is here at Special Collections at U of A, and it's always been concerned with Arkansas history. I'll go next. So my name is Amanda McGee. I am in the fifth year of the PhD program. Um, I mainly do research on the Pennsylvania border, specifically looking at the intersections of gradual abolition, slavery, law, and space. Um, so most of my work is really kind of centralized in archives, um, generally county archives, but some more uh, prominent archives like the Library Company in Philadelphia or the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, but mostly mine are out of Arkansas. Um, so I got into doing proxy research largely because it paid. Um, unfortunately, that's one of the things that we have to worry about as graduate students is where money is coming from. Um, and I love being in the archives. I love 
touching documents and looking at documents and photographs and things like that. And so for me doing proxy research um, at the very basic level is a way for me to get extra income, but also it's a way for me to uh, kind of look at research and documents that I wouldn't have looked at before. Most of the proxy research that I have done has been on um, the Fulbright collections here in special collections. Um, and I don't know much about that. Um, so it's been really interesting for me to kind of look at those collections and look at the international programs that, that is established through Fulbright. Um, and it's been fun, so. And I'm Ryan Smith, and I'm in my fifth year in the PhD program as well. Um, I personally study, uh, write, I'm writing a dissertation on the Arkansas penitentiary system from its inception to the present, um, especially looking at issues of, of labor and health um, and labor activism um, and, and prison activism. But for proxy research, um, like Amanda said, the, the reason why we I got into it personally was just I got an email saying, hey, here's a chance to make some money doing this. And at the time, I think it was a summer after my first year. So I kind of had some, some free time before you know, going back to doing to working on stuff. And so I just sort of picked it up um, and I have been sort of doing it on and off ever since. Um, typically what I look at just because of the nature of the collections in the library and special collections is mostly Arkansas topics. Um, like Amanda said, I also have looked at stuff in the um, Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs um, papers, which is, or collection, which is part of the Fulbright collection. But I've also done stuff on um, <clears throat> Maurice Britt, who was a World War II veteran and, and Mil um, Medal of Honor recipient. And lately, um, because of the pandemic, we sort of had more options and, and more um, opportunities to look at stuff. And I've been looking at papers from architects. So Faye Jones and Edward Stone is what I'm sort of looking on now. And that's a little bit, actually quite a bit different. Um, for one thing, all of the architectural sketches are the sizes of you know tables. So they're huge, huge to look at. Um, but it's, it's a wide variety of things and I enjoy doing it. Um, just because I like being an archive. And I also um, sort of enjoy kind of discovering new things and, and try to relate to maybe how that might influence my own research. Thanks all for introing yourselves and your background with proxy research. Um, so I'm hoping that each of you could talk a little bit about um, I mean, you've talked a little bit about the subjects that you've done research on in special collections as a proxy researcher, um, but could you say a little bit about um, the types of researchers that you have worked for as a proxy? So, um, you know, is it a, an academic researcher, a genealogist, um, uh, some kind of corporate entity like a media company? Um, so if you could share a little bit about uh, what types of researchers you've done proxy research for? So this uh, during the pandemic, I was I got reached out to by a sociologist here in Arkansas at one of the universities, and he's working on a project where he's looking at it's a very interesting project. He's looking on trauma victims, uh, civilians near, that had happened near sorry a disaster that happened near a civilian and how civilians responded to that. And so one of the things he wanted to look at was the Titan II explosion that happened in Damascus in 1980. And uh, so he looked at one of my papers and he knew that I had written on this extensively. And I'm one of the only people who's written on Titan II that actually talks about how civilians are dealing with this. So he reached out to me and was asking what sources I had used. And I told him that there was a lot in special collections, but he told me there was just no way he could get there during the semester. And so he just said, you know, hey, would you like to do proxy research for me? And I was like, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. And so he, I don't think he realized how much there really is. So I went down into special collections and I, I mean, he wasn't as specific as he probably should have been, which is one of my critiques of people who ask for proxy researchers is be very specific. But I went through and I looked at the David Pryor papers. I looked at the John Hammer Schmidt papers. Um, I looked at the Roy Edwin Thomas papers, all of which um, were politicians or teachers during this period who helped document what, what was going on. And so I, you know, gathered all that together for him and sent it off to him. And I think he's working on a book about it right now. Uh, 
Um, mine has come from a, an array of people. I've worked for a professor at George Mason. I've worked for um, just a sort of freelance writer who is, um, who's written a lot of books on World War II. And um, also with like public historians and uh, documentary filmmakers. Um, right now I'm working on in the Edward Durrell paper, Edward Durrell Stone papers for um, a book that's coming out on the US embassy in New Delhi when it opened in the 19, I think 1959. Um, so it's, it's been for a wide array of people. Um, like I said, the pandemic has made you know, this more people are reaching out. I have a feeling that some of these folks would have come and done the research themselves, but they're not able to because um, because of limitations on how many people can get in and who can get into special collections right now. But it's it's I mean, academics are the minority for me. It's been people that are not really um, writing some sort of historical monograph or something. It's been people that are working on different projects other than you know just writing a piece of scholarly. Uh, literature. So my experience has been the exact opposite of Ryan's. <laughs> all of my, all of my uh, people that I've worked with are academics. I will say that um, the last uh, group that I worked with was actually a group of uh, master students. It was a cohort from a university, and they were all kind of working on uh, Cold War era stuff. Um, and so that one was a little bit different because it was a single entity or a single group, but it was the individuals within that group that were asking for different things from different parts of the collection. Um, but for me, most of it has been, well, actually, I lied, all of it has been academics. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the questions that I have um, on the list <laughs> is, um, about how the research that you do as a proxy researcher differs from um, the research that you've done in special collections or archives here or elsewhere um, for your own personal research projects. So in what ways is doing proxy research different um, from doing uh, research that you do for yourself? I would say the major way it's different is because when you're doing your own project, you know exactly what you're looking for and you know exactly what you want to uh, pull out of the sources and take and really document uh, closely. When you're doing it for someone else, though, you kind of want to be very broad and make sure that you're including everything for them. And so it can be a lot different. It's also a lot more fun in some ways, though, because you don't have to have the uh, um, the doom of making sure you don't miss any sources or anything, because you know that you're just kind of, I mean, you're sitting there, you're trying to find the sources you want to find. But when you're doing proxy research for someone else, you can kind of be afraid that you're going to mess it up a little bit. Um, so I kind of have more fun whenever I'm doing my own research personally. Yeah, so I, I would agree. I think it's a little bit more fun. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a respite from my own research because I focus on 18th century uh, Pennsylvania. And so I'm looking at really old documents, documents that have writings on the front and back and that like scribbled into the side that have been folded numerous times. Sometimes they have beautiful penmanship and sometimes it's like deciphering scribbles. Um, and so most of the stuff that I worked on in special collections here for other people have been 20th century documents. And so I can actually read them most of the time without having a dictionary or something and taking forever to kind of decipher what they're trying to say. Um, and then there's lots of photographs and newspaper articles, which I love. I, I'm kind of partial to newspapers in my own research, um, but newspaper articles are really fascinating. Um, seeing the advertisements and stuff from the 50s and 60s are interesting. Um, so it's a little bit more fun and it's a bit of a respite from my own research. And I would argue to some degree, even though it does, like my client said, it requires a little bit of a difference from your own research in terms of doing proxy research, like what you're doing, what you're cataloging, how you're conducting the research itself. Um, but I think to some degree doing proxy research has made me better at my own research um, because I'm paying more attention. I'm paying attention, especially in terms of proxy research, making sure that I don't miss everything and I get all of the stuff that I think that they could possibly need. Um, and then that has kind of carried over into my own research and making sure I'm paying attention to the finer details of things. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with, with all of that. Another thing is, I mean, I don't want this to sound maybe bad, but you don't have to think as much when you are doing proxy research. Like whenever I'm doing my own research on prisons, like I'm looking at every document and just thinking, how does this relate to the argument I'm trying to make? Is this going to be useful? Is it not? With a proxy researcher, you kind of go on autopilot in, in a way. Most of the time, at least for me, my proxy, my research uh, over my, my people that have asked me to research for them, they have given me a, a very specific list of what they want, but they want you to snap pictures of everything. So you don't really have to really engage with each individual document. They're going to do that on their end. Another thing is that you don't have to really interpret these documents. You don't have to like sit there and interpret them in real time and think, oh, this relates to something else that I did. Um, and, and finally, in my own research, there's not a lot of um, photographs or sketches stuff. It's just all written documents. So luckily, I don't deal with the 18th century, so my, most of my stuff is typed out, thankfully. Um, but you know, you, I've been dealing with a lot of photographs, a lot of architectural rending, renderings and things like that. And it, it kind of makes things a little more interesting that way than having to just take pictures of government correspondence. All right, so I'm gonna kind of jump around. Um, we had a question in the chat um, and uh, it goes back to something that one of you said at the beginning, um, which was maybe a critique of proxy researchers being very vague. Um, I think that's also, I think you're kind of understanding the archivist perspective in that sense as well, because um, we often <laughs> uh, have to ask a lot of leading questions to get people to um, be a little bit more specific. Um, but we had a comment in the chat about um, a challenge at their archive is that distance researchers really don't understand the time it would take to do this um, or don't know what the proxy researchers should get paid. Um, I don't know how comfortable you are all about talking about the financial side of proxy research, um, but this person is asking if you have a ballpark figure for hourly or project rates and how you charge. Yeah, I don't mind talking about it at all. <laughs> So usually the department just will throw out there that they normally charge 15 an hour. And I think if you don't really know much about the archive itself or the, the sources you're getting into, I think that's a fair price. But normally if it's something that I'm very familiar with and very comfortable with, I'll charge a little bit more because I know I can do the work a lot faster and also know the sources a lot better. So I've charged 20 an hour before if I thought I could do the work a lot faster than someone else. But maybe Amanda and Ryan have different perspectives. Yeah, so I, I think that's, yeah, 15 is, is generally the basis. Um, the last one that I did because the project was so extensive and it did require um, over uh, 70 hours of work, I ended up charging or uh, being paid $25 an hour for that one. Um, but I know that there are other archivists and these are not, uh, these are independent archives, right? County archives. Um, sometimes they'll charge upwards of 60 to you know $70 an hour. Um, so I think I think it depends on the type of work, the amount of work that you're kind of expecting, um, and then your affiliation with the university or something. Because I know for us, a lot of it is with the department. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you have. I had a researcher say, "I will be paying you this much. Is this okay?" <clears throat> and it was it was thirty dollars an hour. So I was like, "Oh yeah, that sounds great." Um, so I was fine with that. Um, I, I don't think I would do anything that required, uh, I, don't, I don't think I would do anything uh, again for, I've done it for $15 an hour. I wouldn't do it for 15 again. That's not enough um, in my opinion. I think that 20 should be the baseline at least. Also what I've done is I had one project that was very small. It was just, it was going to be like a two or three hour thing in the archive and it was going to be, with with some prep and then some you know organizing of photographs and things at the end for that i was not uh, I, to me it wasn't worth it to say well it's 20 dollars an hour and then go in for two hours and only make 40 bucks i mean i would just be totally frank 
So by, at that one, I said, I will do the job for $100. Because I, I felt like, you know, it wasn't worth my time and energy to really go in and go through the stuff and organize all the photographs just to make, you know, $30, $40. Um, so, you know, if, if anyone who is, you know, listening or whatever is thinking about doing this possibly in the future, I would be aggressive in your pricing. I mean, this is not something that, you know, I, I mentioned that it was not um, sort of a lot of brain work, but it is, it takes some skill. It takes some expertise and you only get better at it the more that you do it. And so I wouldn't, you know, I would be aggressive on, on saying, if someone says we're going to pay you $15 an hour, it's just say, I mean, that's fine with you, go for it. But I would say, you know, I would ask for more than that and don't be afraid to do that. Yeah, and I'm also going to jump on real quick and say that I think if you're like us, the three panelists here, and you're a graduate student looking to do this, you have to realize that this is taking away from your own research because you're conducting research for somebody else. And so kind of balancing that within the price that's, when you, within the price that you charge, um, paying attention and knowing that this might be 70 hours of work that you don't necessarily get to dedicate to your own dissertation. And I think that should help uh, you figure out maybe a baseline of what to charge as well. And one more thing to consider as well, especially when it comes to the sort of the pandemic and people that are coming from distances, it's still going to be much more cost effective for them to hire you and pay you for 10, 20, 30 hours of work than it is for them, especially the, the person I'm working for right now is in New York. So I was like, no, you know, I, they're getting a pretty good deal with me doing it because even if they could travel here, it's gonna, it would cost them a lot more money to do so. So it's not like you are putting them out by asking them this or, or, or asking for them to pay you more. Thank you all for sharing your insights on that. I think um, it's something that often goes kind of um, overlooked or just sort of not acknowledged <laughs> um, that this is paid work. And it does take a lot of time. I mean, of course, it depends on the project, but um, being the person behind the desk in special collections, I've seen you all <laughs> spending many, many hours on proxy research projects. Um, and like Amanda said, that is time that we're taking out of other things that you could be doing, um, things towards your own research. Um, so you've kind of touched on this in, in your answers to this last question, but um, sort of as a follow-up, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about hiring a proxy researcher? Um, and then I guess the other side of the coin, advice you would give to someone who's thinking about taking on proxy research. Yeah, so I kind of mentioned it before, but I would just tell them to set very clear goals of what you hope to accomplish. Um, like we said before, it's nice if they have a price in mind of what they want to spend on the project and how many hours they're expecting you to be in the archive. Um, I think one of the person in the comment kind of said that people usually um, understate how long they think the project is going to take to do research, and that's pretty correct. It usually takes about double the time. I, I think they, they a lot. So if they give you like 10 hours, you're usually thinking like 20 or 30 that it takes to find all the stuff that they want. So just setting very clear goals from the beginning. Um, if you just come in and say, I want to know about Fulbright, that could take, I mean, you could do years of research on that. But if they say they want to know about, you know, Fort Chaffee, Vietnam, Fulbright, that narrows it down immensely right away. So just being clearer and clearer helps the proxy researcher a lot. Yeah, and I also think, um, at least from my perspective, the last group that I worked with, they had already gone through Aon, which are, is the special collections call request system, um, and looked at what specific folders they needed out of what specific boxes. And that was very helpful for me because, like Michael said, it's very specific. And so I could just pull those things that I needed and take the photographs and move on. Um, I would also say that try to set up clear communication lines. Um, oftentimes the projects that I've worked with, it's been like, hey, I need a proxy researcher. I need this and this done. And then it's, they're lost to the, the universe until I contact them. And I'm like, I've finished, here you go. Um, but for me, I want to make sure that I'm taking the photographs. Is everything looking okay? Do you see any kind of like blurring of the images? Is there something that I need to redo? I mean, especially if you're in the, the process of doing it, it's much easier to go back through and take a photograph than 
to be looking at the research, you know, three months from now and saying, well, this picture was blurry or her finger was in the way and I can't see these words. Um, and then having to request that photograph again, or especially if you're looking at um, pictures that have, um, that are on photo paper, that's very reflective, making sure that those look okay. And those are kind of things that you could do a cursory look over the pictures that I've already taken um, and then have that communication set up or have um, a communication with me like once a week to kind of see how the, the, the project is progressing. Do you need more time? Um, is it look, looking like this is gonna be a very short project or um, is there something maybe that I saw that could potentially be added to uh, the pictures that I've already taken that you didn't necessarily request? Um, so I think for me, setting up clear communication guidelines um, and opening that is, is really important. Um, I agree with all of that. I think I've been on sort of, I've had both ends of this. I've had um, someone say, well, I want you to go look at these papers and sort of see what you can find on this. And it was sort of, a, it's very open-ended. The advantage to that is that, it, I mean, if you've got the time, you're probably gonna make more money that way because it's gonna be spending more time in the archive and more time working. Um, it's frustrating though, because this particular project was it wasn't a huge paper collection so it wasn't a big deal but like michael said if someone was like hey i'm running a biography of william fulbright what do you guys got you know like, okay right. well i mean i can be my full-time job like i could retire at the end of that um <clears throat> but the more specific the better you know the more pre-research you've done the better the project i'm working on now this uh it's an organization they went through and gave me bot like folder numbers of what they wanted me to look at. So it was, it's been very, very, very straightforward. At the same time though, I found some stuff when looking at um, manuscript collections, the, the guides online that I think that they might be interested in. So I proposed, well, do you want me to look at this as well? And they said, yes. So being as specific as possible is, is best um, understanding, like Michael said, that a 10 hour project is going to take 20 hours or more, especially if you're like offer something open ended like hey what do you guys know about you know Faye Jones. That's going to be a lot it's going to take a lot of time. Um, if you are starting out as a proxy researcher. Be like Amanda said establish really good clear lines of communication and say do you want me to do this or this and keep them updated. I think the worst thing for a researcher is to say, hey, after you agree to do something as a proxy researcher, and then they never hear back from you or they don't hear from back from you for like weeks. They think, you know, oh, you know, who? because they've never met me. They don't even know what I look like or anything. You know, they don't know me at all. So I could have just, you know, said, yeah, I'll do it and totally forgot about it. So communicate with them regularly. And also, um, you know, don't be afraid to say, do you want me to do this? Or I think this is, would be a better for you because you're the one in there doing the research. You know, you can see what's actually in the archive. Um, they can't, that's why they hired you. So don't be afraid to, to tell them, look, this is not here. Or, you know, would you be more interested in this? Or do you want certain, you know, photographs of this or what? So like, don't be afraid to, to sort of insert yourself a little bit into their own research by, by saying, I think this would be better for you. Yeah, and I also think along the lines of uh, communication and being specific, like sometimes archives, especially the ones, some of the ones that I've been into that are very small, don't necessarily have something like Aon. Um, they might tell you that boxes X, Y, and Z have stuff pertaining to gradual abolition, but then it doesn't tell you what are specifically in the folder. So you could also do like keywords that you're looking for. So when the researcher, the proxy researcher is going through taking those photographs, they can kind of do a scan of the document and say, okay, well, this is a court case that has an enslaved man. Keyword enslaved, perfect. Take a picture of it and move on. Um, and then kind of maybe, and also this is depending on how much work you want to do, but you could potentially tell your uh, whoever hired you, hey, I saw such and such in this folder, you might check this out, this might be relevant. And if that's the case, then maybe I should take folders of or pictures of this, the next three folders afterwards. Um, and so having that communication and then having as best as you can, even if they don't have specific details about what is in the boxes in the folders, 
um, keywords and stuff like that can kind of help facilitate the proxy research better for both you as a proxy researcher. Um, and then, you know, when you actually hire somebody to do that proxy research for you. So we have a couple of questions in the chat that I want to make sure that we get to. So um, one is kind of, uh, I guess, more a question for me. From an archivist perspective, how do you maintain separation between supporting and facilitating research and overstepping and actually doing the proxy research yourself or closely managing the proxy research process? So um, I can really speak to this in terms of um, the University of Arkansas Special Collections. Um, but we, <clears throat> so um, special collections, we will uh, scan up to 300 pages of materials um, from archival collections, uh, and that's per person per semester. So uh, if someone's research exceeds that, I mean, that's sort of how we create a boundary around um, what we can do for distance researchers. And if it exceeds that limit, then um, they need to uh, hire a proxy researcher. Um, we have a lot of international researchers that use our collections because of the Fulbright um, materials and um, uh, especially materials related to the Fulbright program. And those, that collection, those collections are massive. The folders are very thick. And so you could easily reach the 300 page limit in two folders. Um, and so, you know, like Amanda did a ton of work in um, the CU papers and, and those are massive folders. And so you really couldn't get away with just um, the sort of duplication services that we offer um, from the, the staff side of things. Um, but I think that 300 pages is also pretty extensive um, for most researchers. And so um, that's one of the main ways that we um, kind of set our limits on what staff has time to do. Um, we do sometimes get more in-depth reference questions. And it's, again, it's kind of um, dependent on how much time we think something is going to take. So if it's going to take 20 minutes, we can probably do that ourselves, but if it's going to take days or weeks, um, sometimes we uh, have had, you know, like a, a graduate assistant um, that's that's in special collections do some works or like an intern as like a, a project for a student or for an intern that's already within special collections. If it's like, this might take a week. Um, and then if it's bigger than that, um, we, we don't hire proxy researchers ourselves. Uh, so we usually uh, send a researcher who has a substantial amount of work to do. We say, hey, here's the contact for the history department. And um, they can see, you know, kind of send that out um, to their graduate students and see if there's someone who um, is available to do this proxy research. Um, and from there, I mean, it's kind of working with the proxy researchers, sort of like working with any other researcher that comes into our reading room from the archivist side of things. Um, so Amanda and Michael and Ryan submit their AON requests and we pull them and page them and they're in the reading room. Um, and they're the ones that check in and out. The materials get checked in and out to them. Um, so uh, we don't really manage the proxy research process other than we sort of we provide the information, but from that point on, um, our proxy researchers that are coming in and using materials in the reading room are basically operating like any other um, researcher. Uh, sometimes if it's someone that we have helped put them in touch or something and there's some questions or, um, you know, the project's taking a lot longer than originally planned, um, we can kind of step in and help uh, smooth things over. But um, we generally are, are pretty, um, I think the roles are pretty distinct between um, what special collection staff is doing and then what proxy researchers are doing. I hope that answers your question. Um, all right. <clears throat> Um, we have toyed with the idea of potentially hiring um, like a 
creating and hiring a student worker position, like a graduate student level position, that would be sort of like a an on-call proxy researcher, um, so that we we would know that we had the capacity to to have those proxy research projects done. But um, that's not something that we've tried yet. But I'd be interested to see what other archives are doing in terms of that. Um, so uh, another question in the chat is. Um, for, for the panelists, um, have any of you done live video with your distance clients with materials? Um, this is something they thought of suggesting. Um, their space allows for that, but perhaps the archives you're working in do not. I'll let you tackle that. I have never done that before. I've Zoom called with them afterwards and walked them through what I was sending them. But no, I've never talked to them while like in the archive itself. I feel like that would be kind of distracting to other people researching. So I, I wouldn't want to do that in our special collection. Typically, we both hit unmute at the same time. Uh, I've never done it either. I, I what I the, the closest thing I've done to that is literally taking pictures and texting them to um the my, I guess researcher and have them decide you know should i keep going with this um but i haven't done like live in uh, video so i guess that would be a possibility and you know if a researcher asked for that i don't really wouldn't have a problem doing it like the sort of facetiming them i think would really be the best option for me there's not really a capability to like broadcast what's going on in the reading room but i mean i always have my phone so you could use I, I could use that uh, if it was necessary. I think that you know it would be it would be fine. But I've never done it before, and but I can understand maybe in some situations where you might need it. Yeah, I I have not done this before either, and I wonder if this would be more beneficial for somebody that's looking for something very specific, and maybe just a couple of things, um, because I know for me, uh, going through the sea war the 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 Colbert collections that I was looking at, um, it wasn't feasible to do that because it was so much material um, and it was taking me hours and hours and hours to go through it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it would be possible to do that, um, but I do think that's an interesting idea, especially if you're looking for like one particular document, either a picture or a newspaper article or court case or what have you. Um, or maybe you're doing something about material itself and looking at different types of paper or, I don't know, penmanship um, or the frontispieces pieces of books and things like that. That would be kind of interesting. Um, but no, unfortunately, I, haven't, I don't have experience with it. And a little bit of context for our reading room setup in our special collections. Um, we have like, I don't know, 10 tables maybe, and it's a shared reading room space. So um, yeah, there, it would be kind of hard to do like a live um, video call um, in the reading room, unless it was just a really, really quiet day. <laughs> All right, so um, I did want to ask, because I know some of you have done I mean, time is meaningless at this point, but I know some of you have done research before the pandemic and some of you have done proxy research or pre-research mostly during the pandemic. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how conducting research as a proxy during the pandemic was similar or different um, to proxy research that you had done prior to the pandemic. I didn't see a huge difference between before and after the pandemic. The only big difference was just the process of getting to the archive, like having to reserve seat space in the special collections, uh, just normal things you'd have to deal with during a pandemic. But I mean, in terms of the actual research itself, it wasn't really any different. We did it again. Sorry, Ryan. I'm gonna... <laughs> um, so I didn't see as much difference either in terms of like what Michael said, the process, you still take photos the kind, kind of the same way. Um, but I will say from the group that I just worked on, most of it was master students um, asking for the material. And so this is obviously something that they couldn't necessarily get to on their own. Um, so 
I uh, kind of did some tweeting, I guess, or, or looking around Twitter, and it seems like, especially during the global pandemic, well, the global pandemic that we're still in, um, that this is more prevalent and more um, necessary for a lot of graduate students because we don't have the funding to travel. Um, and so when I got the job to help this group of master students conduct research for their theses, it made me more interested to see how other graduate students are handling the global pandemic and especially conducting research in the global pandemic. Um, and I remember this summer when I was going around, some of the archives had opened up, but they're like, you know, the University of uh, Arkansas Special Collections where they have stipulations about when you can go, what materials you can access, how many people can be in the collections and things like that. Um, but there were also other archives, smaller archives that I couldn't have, I didn't have access to because they weren't open and they, they were smaller uh, operating institutions. And so their staff was just not able to come in. They couldn't do it. And so in that regard, it's much more pressing, I think, and important now because it's helped being graduate students who need this research to complete their dissertation, to complete their theses, um, and then get out on the job market. It's much more, uh, I guess, I don't have another word, pressing. <laughs> For me, it, the actual doing, a, the actual collecting the research is pretty much the same. Um, what is different is there seems to be more requests for it. Uh, because of travel restrictions and restrictions on who can get into the archive. Um, obviously right now in special collections, you have to be a student faculty staff member to be able to get in. Um, I need correction, we're, we're back to being open to the public as of like the beginning of September. <laughs> okay, old news, which means we're not gonna get jobs anymore. We're doing proxy research and everybody can come in, great. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, but I, I think that, Going off of what Amanda said with her experience with master students, um, I think in my own research, I think that we sometimes romanticize the archive and talk, think about how we're going to find this document just sort of sitting around that's going to totally alter our um, argument or change our argument or totally uh, support our argument. In reality, it's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of time, and I think that I would be open to and am open to. Most of my research is on Arkansas, so a lot of the archival materials are local, but there are some things, some stuff in like DC and in Wisconsin. And, you know, traveling is expensive and, and getting there is, you know, a lot of work. And so I would not have a problem hiring my own proxy researcher just if I was like, I need to know what's in this particular folder or file. So, you know, pandemic or not, I think that a lot of a lot of people should um, consider that because you know getting there and finding getting the funding to do it and and doing the research is a lot of work, and the reality is you're probably not going to find that magic document um, in that archive if you you know you go to the national archives and you're sitting in the reading room and you know all of a sudden oh I found it you know voila that's not really going to happen, um, so I think that people that people, more people should be open to hiring proxy research because it's much more cost effective, I think. Um, that actually transitions beautifully into this chat <laughs> question, um, which is, do you know if those who hire you are ever drawing from grants for fellowships to pay for proxy research? Um, they are thinking, the person that asked questions said they're thinking about possible barriers to researchers being able to hire proxies, especially for non-tenured or grad students or private researchers. Uh, yeah, I've had them just tell me like, hey, I have a thousand dollars to spend on research and travel funds that they're letting me use on proxy research. Like, let's just give me everything you can. So yeah, they've definitely been open about it before. And then, um, but most of the people I've worked with have just been paying out of pocket, I think. I, I've, I have never had um, anybody tell me where the funds were coming from. My own assumptions is that it's probably tenured faculty that's paying for it out of pocket. But the one, the last group that I did for, like I said, is a, is a group. Um, so I imagine that there was some kind of university funding for this particular cohort in order to get the collections and materials that they need. 
Um, and then I, I would be interested to see uh, what, if grants actually uh, stipulated against proxy research, because the idea is you're still getting the research done. It's just not you physically going and traveling to that place. It's you hiring somebody else to do it. Um, and to that, to that point, you would have more funds to work with because you wouldn't be paying for a plane ticket or um, hotel stay. And you could put all of that money specifically to the research and have a more in-depth you know, experience having somebody, well, not you, but uh, that person, the proxy researcher would have a more in-depth experience because they would have more time um, in the, the, the archives. Um, the same for me, I, I don't really know exactly where the money is coming from for the folks that I've worked for. Uh, the tenure faculty member at George Mason, I mean, it's an R1 university, so he's probably, you know, has a research budget that he's pulling from, maybe. Um, a couple of the others have been like foundations, which I'm sure just come out of their typical budget. Um, the one person that I worked for is a full-time writer. And I really don't have any idea. My, my assumption is that it was just coming out of their pocket, but it could have been coming from money from like an advance on a book or something. Um, I think that, you know, I, I would hope that grants would be open to, you know, an understanding that not just because of the pandemic, but because, you know, what's the most cost effective way for me to do this? And if it's not necessary for me to travel all the way there and to find a hotel or an Airbnb or couch surf on somebody's, you know, somebody's house, that, you know, they would be open to funding that and that that would not be seen as sort of a conflict of, of what they were intending to do in granting the money. Yeah, and from the sort of archivist side of things, I know lots of people in the past have gotten grants to come physically in person themselves. Um, and I know that we had one person who we had talk to them about proxy research. Um, they were originally supposed to visit last winter and now they're, they got an extension on their grant because their grant would not allow them to use the funds to hire proxy research if they had to come themselves. Um, and so they are coming <laughs> this year instead. Um, but it, it's interesting that what I, I don't, I don't know the specifics of that grant, but um, it, it was interesting to me that the, the funders would rather give an extension than let someone use the money in a potentially more financially effective way. Um, we had a comment in the chat about um, having, uh, having had people who specifically written their grants to allow them to hire local proxy researchers. Um, and they pointed out that the, it's also the concept of supporting the local economy. Um, which I think is an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about, honestly. Um, but yeah, I do wonder if more grants will be open to uh, an either or situation um, and, and have a little bit more flexibility in the future, because I think um, at least during this pandemic, I think that the, you know, the importance of proxy research is maybe a bit more obvious to people. Um, and I would hope that that would carry over. Yeah, I think Ryan had mentioned earlier about how like there's this romanticized view of the archive. And I think some of the people writing these grants still kind of have that view that you have to be in the archive doing the research. But in reality, what's the difference if you're getting the, the pictures of it and then you're still thinking about it and thinking through the sources, you're still doing the work. All right, so we are at uh, 10 minutes left. Um, so I had kind of a, a final question to ask you all, but if um, anyone else wants to post any more questions in the chat, we'll try and get through as many questions as we have. Um, but um, my final question for you three is, um, have any of you hired proxy researchers for your own research? And if so, how was that experience? And, has being a proxy yourself informed the way that you hired? I have not hired a proxy, but I probably will have to for my dissertation going forward in the next year or so. So I'm planning on it. 
I have um, not necessarily hired a proxy, but I have hired the archives. Um, there's an archive in Washington County that I wasn't able to access over the summer. And they have a couple of documents that I needed access to. And they're, I'm, I'm basically paying them to take a PDF or high resolution images of those documents and send them to me. Um, but there are also other archives that it, I just don't know how feasible it would be for me to physically go there um, because they're so spread out. I'm looking at things along the Mason Dixon line, the Pennsylvania, New Jersey border, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, that it would just be better, I think, to hire a proxy researcher in order to get some of like this, this work done and, and be able to produce a dissertation at the caliber that I want to produce it. Um, I see that there are some people in the history department here who are probably like, you just need to finish it. Um, but graduate students are perfectionists. I don't know what to tell you. So. <laughs> Thanks for calling us out, Amanda. But. <laughs> <clears throat> I have not hired a proxy researcher either, but I can foresee it happening in the future. There are, um, you know, sometimes collections that you think should be in sort of, for example, just for me, in the state of Arkansas, relating to Arkansas history should be in Arkansas, but like the University of Wisconsin, I think has a big collection of like Little Rock Nine stuff and civil rights stuff associated with Arkansas. And it's just bizarre, like why, why do you have it? Um, but for me personally, like there is a couple of, um, collections in the National Archives that are relatively small that I would like to look at for my own research. And I would love to go to DC and do it, but that's not necessarily financially feasible and also difficult scheduling wise, because like we said at the beginning, we're all teaching. And so that would be something that I would be willing to hire a, a, a proxy researcher to do. Um, and it would be much more cost effective and easier for me and far less time consuming for me. Um, I think that I don't I don't have this sort of fear that they're not going that they're going to miss something. I don't really have that fear of that. Um, and so I would not have a problem doing it at all. And I foresee that I probably will do it. Um, so we didn't get any more questions in the chat. So um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, do our panelists have any final thoughts? Um, we have some thank yous in the chat. <laughs> all right. Um, well, if not, um, thank you all for being here. Um, if you registered for this, which you had to have to get the link, um, you will receive the recording, which will go up on YouTube later today. Um, so if you want to look back at anything that we talked about today um, or share that recording with other people that you think it might be useful for, um, please feel free to, to share. It'll be on YouTube. Um, and uh, if you are a grad student at the University of Arkansas or you know some grad students at the University of Arkansas, um, one, let them know about proxy research opportunities, um, but two, uh, please encourage them to do some research in special collections. Um, we are excited to have grad students um, be engaged with the materials and participate in this graduate student speaker series. Um, we are offering um, honorariums for uh, speakers um, now and in the future. Um, so uh, if you know someone who uh, is working on some research um, and has worked in special collections, um, please send them our way. Um, all right, with that, I will wrap it up. And um, thank you all for being here and thank you again to our panelists.